And here we are, episode four of Whiskey Unscripted. And if I press this button on the other end of the line, there should be, and he doesn't know it yet, rap superstar Gordon Dundas. Hello. How are you, Gordon? I'm okay. I'm all right. Sorry, I've just been driving around my hood. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I've just been off the phone to Polydor and uh, uh-huh. another record label I can't, can't remember. And the reason that I started with a, such a, a, a strange way to start the episode four of Whiskey Unscripted season two, and hello, by the way, to everybody downloading, thank you very much. Hello, 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 hello. Is that, when we've put these shows together, it is unscripted, but when we interview people, I usually cut in the interview into the show. So far, so good? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. And when you do that, sometimes I, I listen to, you know, what I say and what you say, as I'm doing a little bit of the edit, just to get the things in the right order. And this yeah. little quote happened a couple of weeks ago, Gordon, and I just couldn't get it out of my head. So I just got the free hiphopsbeat.com, and you're allowed to use this um, this piece of music. Gordon, what do you think to your new career? Let's see if this works. <laughs> You can't drink gold, or you can't drink a house, a house. Uh, you can't drink, uh, you can't drink, you can't drink a house, <laughs> gold. Uh, you can't drink gold. Uh, you can't drink gold, or you can't drink a house, a house. It's, it's profound. It's profound. It is profound. It is. Um, do you remember saying that? <laughs> I do remember saying that. Um, that's uh, that's not fifty pence. That's five pence. <laughs> if you haven't heard that episode yet, basically it was about whiskey as an investment. It was. It was. Um, and that is the best thing about it. You can always drink it. So we're looking for a theme tune, but I guess the search continues. I think the search continues. Yes, okay. I'm. Uh, I've been speaking to. Um, Tim Rice, actually, um, who obviously is not as busy as he normally is with the theatres mm-hmm. shut, yep. and he's he's listening in, he's going to listen in, and he's going to come up with one in the next couple of weeks for us. Um, really good. Not sure how we're going to pay for it, but uh, that, that, Tim that's... Rice is uh, he's he's on the case. Don't worry about that, Gordon. Because you know, flannel is my middle name. Just get get that piece of music. Well, welcome to episode four, Gordon. Yes. You're tasked every week with catching up on some of the whiskey news for us well yes and to be honest this week has been dominated by a certain row online i think would be the way to describe it um and it would be remiss and and totally not uh not right if we didn't mention it which Mm -hmm. is um uh, a friend of mine good writer becky paskin has called out the infamous jim murray on his use of sexist and sort of misogynist uh, language in his tasting notes for some of his whiskies in his new bible and uh, yeah i think it's it's caused a caused a, a a bit of a a necessary furore i think is what i would say i think uh, it's a row it's not a row it's a, it's a, you know it's it, i don't quite know how to describe it but yeah. it's certainly something which needs to be eradicated from the industry um, and anything that is, you know, it's our, it's everybody's whiskey. It's not. It's it, everybody should be comfortable, um, you know, reading that book and how how things are 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 described. And and I think it's uh, it's time for us to to be better as as an industry. Uh, we've moved on and come on a lot, and I think Becky would agree. But um, we've not we've not eradicated. We've not we've not become the the fully modern industry and equal equal industry that we should be. And I think that's more and more the case, but things like this don't help. And I think that's the, a really good point. So, yeah, I, I, as I say, I'm not, I can't say I've poured over every book he's ever written. So is it just this particular book or is it stretching back in a number of years? Of course, I've thumbed, thumbed through a few of the, the books, but is it just mm. specifically this one? Has the language changed from the past? No, I, I actually think what's happened is that actually clearly nobody really reads the book because there's so many <laughs> reviews in it. I mean, it's 3,000 odd whiskey reviews, I understand, which apparently he tastes every year, which means that he must be tasting 10, about 8 whiskies a day, maybe 9 whiskies a day, which is quite a lot. Yeah. Um, 
I think they've probably been in there for a while, and I think what's happened is that some, you know, somebody's picked up on it. Becky's picked up on it and um, has highlighted this, and um, it's something which I think has resonated throughout the industry, and certainly, you know, something that we support as a as a as a business, and um, uh, it's certainly something which is very uh, uh, needs to be addressed and needs yep. to be needs to it be does. taken to task. I'm afraid, with someone with two daughters, uh, I'm all for that. I have to say, I think these things have to be have to be challenged. And if it's nothing malicious behind it, you just yeah. refocus different language onto it. And hopefully, there's nothing malicious behind it. Not just this specific incident, but um, the, the other sort of sexism uh, and misogyny that masquerades as jokes. That's one of my bugbears. As the yeah, father no, of two I, daughters. I, so No, I would absolutely agree with that. So that's been the main sort of dominating news, and we'll see how that continues to develop. But I think certainly uh, it's something that needs, you know, has been called out, should be called out. You know, Jim Murray is a very polarising person anyway, and for me there's many better sources of whiskey information, reviews and things online from uh, that, that I would look at for my information. So, well, yeah. I've got a couple of bits I've used myself, Gordon. Um, first up, let's deal with uh, some correspondence. We got an uh, email from a Richard Cutler who mm. asked um, if occasionally, he said, good show, yeah, guys, um, when we're doing some of the tastings or even talking about yeah. whiskies, could we yeah. mention budgets and how much they cost? Yes, I now, think we could. We, we could mention that. And, of course, we work for Ian McLeod's mm -hmm. and I got... Literally, the day after this came in, I've got it here, I got a correspondence from IT Nigel. IT you know, Nigel. You know IT Nigel. IT Nigel, fantastic, fantastic. Always knows where to stick a HDMI cable in the right place to make things work. IT Nigel sent yeah. me um, a list, and this is completely unrelated to Richard Cutler's email, right. um, from Forbes magazine. Right. The best bargains in Scotch whisky, according to the oh, experts. Right, yes. And there's one of our whiskies in there for thirty-two dollars, which in our mm -hmm. terminology is about twenty-three pounds. Says, yeah. um, bang for the buck. If you want to drink a Scotch and a soda highball, this is the jam. Just a right amount of sweetness offset with a lemon twist. Yummy. So it also fits the budget, and that is what is called pig's nose blended mm. Scotch whisky. One of ours is in there. Fantastic. And there's a prime example of a whiskey never to be put off because it's blended. A lot of people get a little bit single malt sort of snobby. Yeah. You should always consider drinking other whiskeys for sure. And Pig's Nose is a great one. So I don't know if you found that one there yet, Gordon. I no, can't I go through them. I'm on a completely different um, article about blankets now. So <laughs> that's not the right one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so my Richard, we can certainly, when we're drinking or tasting whiskeys, put them into some sort of uh, budget. But they had a uh, Lafroy, Monkey Shoulder, Glenlivet, Oban, uh, Pig's Nose, and the Kirkland Signature. Some of mm. the Forbes magazine's best buys in Scotch whiskey. So that was right. um, well, that's one. nice as a as an independent family business to have some whiskies in that list of mainly big brands. That's great. So great. So please, that's a, that's a, a nice one. And the other piece of news there, Gordon, is last week. Mm. I think the previous podcast we mentioned about doing a. a Charity event for Chaz, the Children's Hospices yes. across Scotland. Yep. Um, one of the most worthy causes you'll ever find uh, out there with children in Scotland with life-limiting uh, illnesses. And this is a way of raising money, because of not in the last few months with everything that's going on. So they're doing, in the month of October, a dinner party and drinks party. Now we c you've got to do it with your own households. Mm -hmm. But you can buy these kits in. There's a Glengoyne whiskey kit. And there's a food mm -hmm. tasting kit. You go to Chaz website for all the details and uh, Chaz, all the social media channels for Chaz. And the chef and the whiskey guys have recorded special that you can only see videos if you buy these kits. Not available to the public. And I recorded mm -hmm. one with Fred McCauley and rugby legend Andy Nichol last week. Mm -hmm. And it's right. now going on a special private channel for Chaz. And if you buy the Glengoyne whiskey tasting kits, you can taste along with us and also play the quiz. It's all whiskey questions. And here's a little oh, flavour. I love a quiz. Oh, I love a quiz. Well, I love here's a, a quiz. Right, okay, here's a little flavour of what you could get if you go and buy one of these kits from Chaz. And this is educational for me, Gordon. And uh, I mean, Fred is a lot uh, more experienced than I am in many, many ways. 
And so I Andy, you didn't get into whiskey too early, so we wouldn't have the the legend that is Andy Nickel for Scotland. You'd have been not in the team. Well, uh, well, I remember that there was a uh, a whiskey brand sponsor Scottish rugby pretty much my whole career. So uh, whiskey has been all around rugby um, in the in the obvious way, but also in the sponsorship way as well. And Glen Goyne uh, clearly have been a great sponsor of supports of Scottish rugby uh, for for many years as well now as well. well story to Andy. Um... Not an experienced whisky drinker. I am very fond of whisky, the concept. I'm fully aware of what, aware of what it does for Scotland. And um, like Andy, my father was a very experienced whisky drinker. Um, and uh, he, in fact, when he left the police, he the job that he went for was as security manager of the John Dewar bottling plant in Perth. And he was Ooh. absolutely gutted when he didn't get it. Um, it went to a chief superintendent who had retired at just the same time as dad. Uh, so he got he got the nod. So dad was a little bit fed up with that. But he ended up going to Glen Eagles, which in those days was owned by Diageo. And uh, he, he had a, an endless supply of good whiskies. And I've got, I, I guess, Andy, you'll be the same. You know, when you do a little favour for somebody or a charity gig, you, you often end up with a bottle of whiskey. And I used to collect them. And I gave my father any doubles that I had. Uh, my father-in-law enjoyed the drum as well. He got a few bottles too. And then about a decade ago, I gave them all away. Uh, they went into McTears, the auctioneers, and uh, they all got auctioned off and the money went to cystic fibrosis. So the last decade, I've just been building up the, the stocks again. So, you know, if I was to show you my uh, whiskey store next door, there's probably a good maybe two or three dozen bottles there, you, you know, all very individual and uh, hardly any of them, Gordon, you'd be disgusted to hear, open. <laughs> there's, there's time. There is time, friends, you know, and you've got friends now. So, you yeah. know, we're just a stone's throw away. But listen, would you like to get into the first whiskey of the evening? So I hope, Gordon, that will go down quite well. Oh, absolutely. And talking of quizzes... I've got a couple of questions that I wanted to just run past you. Oh, hold on, yes. Uh huh. We we started this off in the first series, and and I, with our sort of hand wash challenge, and I wanted I wanted to sort of try and go back to that a little bit. Well, I think just, we'll uh, all have to go back to that. Well, I, well, we are going back to that, unfortunately, <laughs> but because uh, we've talked about blends, I wanted you to name as many blends oh. as you can. Oh my. Or um, as many blends as you can who you think are in the top ten blends in the world. In by the world. volume, by volume, by volume. Let's go to, let's go to Japan because most of these are blends. Um, hibiki. Um, Is not it, by volume. Not no. by volume. Okay, not let's go across America. Uh, Tommy Dewar White Label. Um, in America. Uh, yes, I think it is. It's it's right up there. Yes, it's it is. It it sells two point five million mm. cases. Johnny Walker Red. Anywhere. Johnny Walker sells about 19 million cases. That is amazing. Let's go this to this country. I'll we'll go for a grouse. The naked grouse, the famous grouse, all, all the grouses. Yeah, that's about a 3 million case brand globally. So okay. there you go. Yeah, um, very good. Very big in the UK, about 1.5 million cases. Maybe go down to Spain. I think maybe quite common in some of the Latin American countries. Um, Cutty Sark? Cutty Sark, yeah, Cutty big Sark brand, big brand. Where is it? I'm trying to find it. Oh, yeah, but definitely in the Ooh. a big brand now owned by um, who's it owned by now? Uh, it's owned by La Martiniquez, I think, the French. Oh. Um, but yes, big brand for sure. Yeah, any others? I, I'd go Time Buchanan's, really up. Buchanan's finest blend. Buchanan's, it's not. Yeah, it's a big a one. It's not one of the biggest, but it's a pretty big one. The oh, big I'll stop one. the tap there. I'll stop the tap. That, the, hand, the hand wash challenge. What have we got? Well done. Well done. Well, you missed out, really. The two I would have missed out, you missed out a couple were Ballantines. Oh, of course. The Shivers. And um, the other one was, I mean, Johnny Walker's the biggest by a mile. Shivers Regal as well. Ballantines. Absolutely. But no, very good. Very good. Great, well done. Well that, done. That, that begs me to ask, what are you drinking this week? Just when you mentioned about... Um, Blended whiskey. I have in my possession a little sample of North British mm. single grain whiskey. Now, people sometimes nice. might be listening, and just the, the the blends that Gordon referred to there are a combination of this of grain whiskey and malt whiskey. And I've got a twelve year old North British grain whiskey at fifty two point one. Wow! I've That'll never be... tasted it yet. Well, I think you'll find it be quite light. Um... 
because there's not a lot of flavor in a green whiskey spirit because it's it's always at a higher strength but it'll be quite light i would imagine mm-hmm. matured in a refill bourbon cask refill cask yeah. quite light in color light in light taste cost. but yes. it'll be really really good it'll be good a lot of very good single grains there for sure packs packs more flavor than you would think i suppose 12 years in those mm-hmm. casks you will get some flavor out of it but that's my first green whiskey i've had in a while and is that a, a sector or a category do you see a, a, on on the increase I'm not so sure, if mm-hmm. I'm honest. I think blended malt is where there's going to be a lot more increase, personally. I think a single grain serves a purpose. It, it's a little bit one-dimensional, arguably. But I think where where whiskey will start to increase is in the blended malt category. Because, you know, it, 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 when you blend different malts together, you've still got malt whiskey. They're just not single malts. So you actually get a the, the benefit of blending different Sink different flavored whiskies yeah. together that are all of the quality of malt, which is, which I think blended malt is a really good. I think it will be a, a much bigger category in the future, driven by provenance, driven by those types of things. Um, you know, Monkey Shoulders a big brand in in that category currently, but it's not. It, it doesn't really play the blended malt game, if you know what I mean. So, um, I think uh, it's uh, that's the growth area for me more than uh, more than. Single malt and blended malt, single grain, I think it will be amongst the sort of people who know about it, yes, and blends, I think, will continue to be pretty flat, would be I think. If, I think if I was a blender, Gordon, and I'm sure it's been done, because um, I know the art of the blender in Japan is revered here, maybe oh, absolutely, not as yeah. much, but I would... Um, try and create blended whiskies but have the provenance of the single grain like the one i'm holding now is 12 years why do you yeah. not see that in labels as much or has it been done when you talk about the malt all the time but the grain is often overlooked it's not a bad well, you gotta remember most all. most grain whiskey is 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 taken out of cask after three years yeah you know very very few very little it's not it's not made to be produced as a as a single grain whiskey if you know what i mean that one you've probably got was was a cask that's just happened to turn up somewhere that's 12 years old if you know what i mean yeah. it, it, it most of it is emptied at three years you know to, to keep up with that ability to create blends so that that the, 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 a small small percentage that get through to being older and that's where you do start to see a little bit more interesting sort of developments on 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 the, on the style so yeah i mean i think can I just yeah. say, Gordon, that I uh, don't mm. know if you have, but I had a wonderful tour around North British, which is in Edinburgh, mm. in the west side of the city, uh, beside Tyne Castle Football Club. And it is a major industrial complex. Quite a, 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 a operation I've got going on there. Ended up in the boardroom with all the pictures of the chairman that have gone before, starting with number one, Andrew Usher Jr., who's on the wall, which, as you know, my mm. love of history, it was amazing. That was the boardroom that Andrew Usher started North British Distillery there in the 18, uh, 1880s, eight, early 1890s, but the grain comes off of, uh, out of leaf docks, 364 days of the year, constantly mm. going. It's just, what an operation. So that's North British Grain Distillery. Very good, very what, good. Have you got anything lined up for a I small have. gram? I have. I've, I've managed to pull a bottle of whiskey that I've not tried for a while. Ardmore. So this is a distillery from the Highland region, um, owned by Beam Suntory. Uh, it is peated. Uh, this is called the triple wood, so uh, matured in quarter casks, barrels, and different punchings of great, great whiskey, mainly American oak. Uh, lovely packaging, great whiskey, and uh, I'm I'm a big fan of it. I have to I say, that. I'm uh, yeah, I really like the uh, the sweetness that comes with it. A little bit of pepperiness, peat. It's very different peat to Isla peat. Not not very smoky at all, but a really, really lovely whiskey. A, a, a big component of teachers, big part of teachers, and it's up up at sort of yeah, near. It? It's sort of in between near Glendronach, not far from Glendronach. Right. Um, but it's not a space side, and as is Glendronach, it's a highland, and um, yeah, very near a railway, a bit like Tam do in terms of that was the access to the market. Great whiskey, um, a, a malt that is a bit underrated, I think, but uh, really, really good whiskey. Um, so I'm drinking that, and I really very nice. like it. Good, good quick thing about the, the name, just to tell you about the name. So the name actually comes from a place not far from where I'm from. Um, the teacher family uh, had a house on a place called Ardmore Point, which is between Cardross and Helensborough, not far from where I'm, I'm from, Helensborough. Yes. And, and so the distillery was named after that 
sort of point Ardmore, although it is way up in the Highlands. So that is the the story behind the name. So there we go. Really um, cool. Great, great whiskey. So one that I I actually found, I had about. Uh, a quarter of a bottle left, so I thought I'm going to pour that for whiskey unscripted today. Great that's, whiskey. That's, that's, that's fantastic. So there's two good drams. And for our friend that contacted us, Richard Cutler, I know you won't know the price offhand, but are we talking mid range, high range budget? What's the. So roughly? By, it was actually a travel retail whiskey, I think, from what I can remember. Um, so it was in the. Tra- it might still be in travel retail. So, um, but uh, really, really nice, and about fifty or sixty pounds, forty-six percent as well makes it superb. Well, that's has done some of the news, some of the tastings, and yeah. a little bit of rap at the beginning, and I just put a little addendum to it. I was up um, when we were still allowed to travel in Dornoch, and I bumped by sheer chance, walked past a garage, and saw the Dornoch whiskey distillery, literally uh-huh. in a garage. No, not much bigger Masona here. But uh-huh. we'll maybe put some photographs up on the website or the um, Instagram and mm. we'll talk about that at another time. Gordon, I hear the music. Is it? It is. What letter are we on? Oh, gosh. O. O. We're on oh. the letter O. Um, so, um, yeah, a little bit easier than Scotch that. whiskey. Yes, A's N last week was a tricky one. So, the O. What have you got for us? O. Well, I'm going to start with um, a couple of brands. Just to run through three, three, probably three brands. Oban, mm-hmm. so Oban Distillery, right in the middle of the town of, of Oban. Old Pulteney up near up in Wick. Um, lovely, lovely whiskey with that sort of maritime element. Octomore, um, oh, yes. very, very peaty. I think it's it sells itself as the most peated ppm whiskey there is um, and well sought after. And finally, Old Par, another famous blend. That oh, yes. um, is uh, so. So that's some of the brands. How about you? I'll go for the um, um, the olfactory system, which is the the entire whole nose and um, epithelium behind your nose, the whole smelling uh, apparatus that you bring to a whiskey. It's called the olfactory or olfactory system, and really that's the big, biggest part you could argue of, of whiskey enjoyment is nosing. And smelling, yeah. and people often ask, you know, why do people smell uh, their whiskey? And it's really just to tell you, pa- tell your palates what it's going to receive. Definitely. A very good book, by the way. Um, I'm holding it just now here. A guy, Adam Rogers, wrote a book called Proof: The Science of Booze, and he is absolutely forensic in every aspect of the scientific approach to alcohol consumption and enjoyment. And I'm not going to details about the uh, olfactory system, but it's a whole chapter. Mm. And there was a couple of Canadian scientists won a, a Nobel Prize mm. for exactly finding out what happens when you <sighs> breathe in, but it goes straight mm. to the brain and other parts of the brain fire off, like experience and memory. So it's a hugely, almost underrated part. Not if you're into the world of whiskey, but people outside looking in think, What's, what are they doing? But, Trust me, yeah. it really is a great height in your enjoyment of the dram. Nice. Well, um, a few other things that I just want to touch on. Uh, optic barley, which was a variety of barley that was created in the 90s, pretty much not used as much as it was anymore. Barley has a very sort of shelf life. It lasts for about 10, 15 years, whatever. So you might have heard historically of sort of golden promise variety used in the 90s and things like that um and um and it's on a good uh, point on that gordon the, the, the scottish whiskey association have a list of prescribed barleys you cannot just grab a, a strain from here there and everywhere if you want to make scotch whiskey no, is that correct right. yeah yeah i believe that is correct yeah but i mean it's it's you know again without going into it, we talked about nitrogen and, and how important that is in terms of its levels, in terms of what you're going to get. You know, Optic was very, very good for a while, but it, they, they, you know, they get resistant to disease. They have a shelf life. You move on to different varieties, and we're very much in a in a different area now. But um, and very quickly, one or two other things, just because I know we've got lots to get through. Oak, obviously. Oh, oak. Fantastic. I've got, oak. Oh, I've got a bit here. I'm going to hit it. Yeah. I bet I, I you brought smashing back that from, off, you smashing that off your head. Yes, yeah, off my old bonds. I brought that back from Hereth last October, yeah. and that is some lovely. And what I, you know, looking at it, you can't really tell whether it's American or European oak. 
visually? No, difficult to tell. Very difficult to tell, for sure. Um, It is very difficult to tell. Um, I mean, it's much easier to understand the difference when you taste it in a whiskey. Um, And I think the key thing is, I always want to get across, it's oak that matures whiskey. That is the point. When you taste a whiskey of 25 years, it's the oak that's made it that colour. It's the oak that's made it that style. Um, And that's really, really important to remember. So, um, American oak, European oak, Mizanara oak. There's many types of oak uh, that can be used. Uh, We've used Scottish oak. We've used, you know, English oak has been used. There's there's no, as long as it's oak, you can mature it uh, for whiskey in Scotland. And it's an amazing sort of there we go. combinations. Our new make spirit in oak. Wonderful. Great double acts of our time. Right, yeah, that's us. That's the O's. I think that's the O's. The 80 Z's are a finish on the O's. Oh, that's right. uh, that wasn't bad. Gordon, now set up this interview because I've, I've listened to a little part of it and it's absolutely it's fantastic. Really good listen. Yeah, no, look, um, Scott's a good mate of mine and he uh, has been doing some great stuff with Tomatin and... Uh, you know, friend, friend of the show, um, we, we've, and I just wanted to get his sort of lowdown on a whole load of different topics and subjects. He's a, he's a great ambassador. He's, um, he's um, a huge sort of geek of the industry as well. And uh, he's always good to listen to. So, uh, yeah, listen. over to Scott. How are you, sir? I'm very good. This is when we're going to find out that we're actually going live on Facebook and everything without knowing about it. That's fine. I, you know, that's very whiskey unscripted, to be honest. Yeah. Um, um, how has everything been going for you? You've 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 been busy during this lockdown period, and you've done some really really great content online, which I've, I've been following as much as I can, um, and it's been been really really interesting. And if you, I mean, as we were just discussing offline, we've both learned so much about this sphere in the last sort of. Uh, six to eight months haven't we yeah yeah it's been it's been pretty crazy i'm not in any way um tech savvy or anything like that but i guess with the the time that we've not had to travel we've had time to learn about these things and yeah like you say i've been been very busy i think um a lot of people in the roles that we perform have been on furlough or things like that but um the way Tomatin and uh, and you guys as well have adapted has just meant that we've been able to keep very busy and keep in touch with whiskey fans and things like that. So we um, we got the jump on it pretty early. I fourteenth of March was the the day that we kind of that was our uh, well the thirteenth of March was our last day in the office, and I'd been in Denmark that week, and I get back to a letter saying that we're we're in we're going to be working from home. So that was the week before lockdown went official, and we kind of had that whole week to kind of devise a plan as to Mm. what we were going to do because I think at that point everyone kind of knew that this is the way things were going and we would have to adapt and um, yeah luckily as as is the case when you've got a small team we're able to adapt and move quite quickly and just develop things that we thought were going to be fun it didn't necessarily have to be you know People are going to forgive you if um, there's technical issues and things like that at a time like this. You know, oh, yeah, we're, yeah. we're very good at going and standing up in front of a room of 30 people and talking, but sitting at home just looking at a computer is a totally different beast altogether. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So no, um, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, I think generally the whiskey industry's done pretty well. I mean, there's obviously a lot of, you know, one of the main areas that we that, that was that was challenging and still is a little bit challenging is obviously from a visitor centre perspective. If we move away a bit from ambassadorial, um, and, and you look at how you can re- reciprocate or 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 create that visitor centre experience online, it's just not the same. Um, and we we're now open again and we have visitors, but the numbers are obviously way down from where they would be normally. So so we're still working on that virtual experience, which we've tried one or two things, and some of them have worked, some of them haven't, and the frequency and all those types of things. Are you doing similar things at at Tomatin? So so we've opened the visitor centre again on, uh, it's open Friday, Saturday, Sunday. um, Right, okay. Guys are off. So I think, you know, one of the things that's unique about Tomatin is that we've got the village on site, you know, the, the workers live on site. So there is that degree of, you know, it's not just a case of protecting the staff. We've got to protect everybody, their family as well. So what we've done is we only do tours when the guys are not on shift. So when the distillery, all you can really see at the time is fermentation bubbling away. Um, but it's better than nothing. In terms of trying to adapt that, I think what we kind of came to terms with pretty early on was that, 
what the visitor center is great for is bringing in new people to not just the brand but to whiskey as a whole you know people mm. drive past uh, we're, we're halfway between Inverness and Aviemore great kind of tourist destination like yourselves down near Glasgow so we get a lot of passing people that stop in and are introduced to whiskey through us yeah and I think what we realized throughout lockdown was that we're going to struggle to really do that because there is this element of an echo chamber. You're speaking to people that are already interested in whiskey and to an extent your brand. So things like the Lockdown Whiskey Festival were great for bringing people in. Uh, good, yeah. we, we did two of those with massive, massive outturns. But I think what we've been trying to do over the last few months, rather than do the sort of visitor center experience, is kind of go back to what we did very, very well a few years ago, which was be in touch with the whiskey community, you know, the people that are already drinking the product. and um, and kind of add value to that. So the sessions that we've been doing, similar to yourselves on the on the podcast here, is it's not a weekly Tomatin or Glengoyne advert. It's yeah. it's a conversation about whiskey with people that love whiskey and maybe people that you wouldn't always, uh, as a consumer, get to engage with. So yeah. I've been lucky to speak to coopers and um, bartenders and whiskey club organisers and things like that. So yeah. great to dive behind the scenes and see the cogs that make the whiskey machine turn. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the things that when we thought up, we wanted to do something, particularly in that initial period of lockdown when everybody was literally at home, not not going out. And um, we were very conscious of creating something that as a producer that was that, that can give insight into whiskey as a producer, but was not just about us. And it was about the industry. It was about speaking to other brands and other great whiskies and ed trying to educate. Well, well, obviously trying to be amusing and, and funny as well. And I think we've, I don't know if we've succeeded, but it's it's a, it's something that we're very conscious we want to keep doing. And and uh, so, you know, we, we, we get great people listening and I get great messages. And, and you, I know, got the same for your, for your sort of, I mean, the Lockdown Whiskey Festival is great, the, the, the softer softer sessions um, yeah. that you did, uh, softer, were really, really great as well. And, and I know that a lot of people fed into them and really, really enjoyed them. So I think we both had the same sort of idea of what we wanted to create. Yeah. Yeah, um, the, the sessions were great. I think, um, so th the last one that we did was the last one that we're doing in this sort of live format. Um, we are looking to do things now as, as we start to move back to being able to go out a little bit more, you know, we kind of want to meet people in person. And so one of the ideas we had was like the connection between whiskey and golf. Uh, we're, we've got very close links to, uh, no pun intended, to Castle Stewart. And um, and we were going to have them on in a session because that's another industry that's hurting right now, mm -hmm. um, golf tourism. So, But rather than that, what we've decided to do is actually go to Castle Stewart and see the, the course and speak to the guys there. And it's not going to be the same format, but, you know, we, we made a point of this being the last live session um, we'll maybe use it again for product releases, get people to ask questions in that format. Um, but but one thing that was really quite overwhelming, actually, was the outpouring of feedback afterwards. I met people thanking us and things like that. I think I didn't for me at the time when we were doing them, there was a selfish element to them as well. You know, I I was. I was wanting to speak to people about whiskey, you know, that it, it, it filled a filled a job for me as well. And it also um, it gave me plenty of work to do, which I, I was more than thankful for. You don't realize quite the impact that these are having. You know, you see the, the number of views and that's almost hard to imagine what that looks like. I often look, you know, like the the Lockdown Whiskey Festival absolutely was the biggest example of this. 11,000 people watching on the day. And you can't imagine that in a masterclass. And even no. when you get to the 250, 200 views on a video, mm -hmm. it's pretty big numbers. You know, you, your normal masterclass is 30 people. Um, so to have tenfold of that watching is, it's almost hard to picture it. And then when you start getting the messages through from everyone saying, thank you so much. And mm -hmm. um, I've really enjoyed what you've been putting out over the last few weeks and months. Yeah. And it, it really does reaffirm the approach that, the that we've taken to the the situation and mm. uh, it says to me that you know yes there's a commercial element to what we do but there is also the hardcore fans that we are as well you know we're the hardcore mm. fans i'm sure like you we mm. we watch uh, roy on thursday nights on aquavite and, and tune into things like that it's so it's yeah. 
yeah. it's good to recognize that that's that's important no, hugely and i think you know i think i think i think there's so many there's so many areas people can get whiskey information from now and i think getting it from brands in a way that's not just brand heavy brand, you know is really really enlightening and and i think that's what's what's great about you know what you've done what we've done and other brands have done as well you know i know there's um, like the the, the guys at Angus Dundee have been quite busy online as well. And there's been a few other brands that have done a lot. And I think that's been really, really good. And, um, you know, I, I, and, and I think that's, and it will become part of what we do going forward. It will still be part of the future because I think sitting in front of your computer, although we were talking about this, with, is there a little bit of fatigue? We'd love to get people's thoughts on that. It's, it's, it is part of the new normal. It may not be, it might, it might be 50% the new normal at the moment, in the future, it might be 20, but it's still going to be part of how we do things in the future. Yeah, 100%. I think that, that's something that we were talking about a little bit. You know, we, we certainly saw, I mean, this coincided with our move away from Friday nights to Tuesday nights and to, to bi-weekly, but we did see a drop off in numbers. And that, was, um, that wasn't that was a problem for me. I always thought, you know, as long as I'm getting 30 people watching, it's like doing a masterclass. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Very, very happy that we were getting loads more than that. Um, but we did see a tail off and... I do think there is an element of fatigue. The, the view that I would have is, you know, during lockdown, when people were on Zoom, it was quite unique. But now that everyone's starting to go back to work, right. it's it's their nine to five. And then they go home, well, they, they close their laptop, go to the kitchen, have their dinner, and then we're asking them to come back and go back on a laptop. So one yeah. of the things we did, and it's, it's what you guys have been doing the whole way through, is we made the sessions available to um to download as a podcast on like so spotify and things like that and the thought then was that you know you could listen to the to the conversation while you were going for a run maybe while you were commuting while you were in the car and the thought then was that actually this is a point of difference from sitting watching a screen again you know? um, yeah and, and we saw a good bit of uptake on that so that was great well so the, I, yeah, the, so the, content, the conversation is still important it's just about finding a balance between you know sitting at a laptop all day and then doing it again in the evening for people. I, I think that I think that there is that, and I think that's one of the reasons that we felt that um, you know we felt a podcast was it gives people more opportunity, particularly in lockdown, walking dogs, doing your exercise, all that. You're not sitting in front of your computer, um, and um, so you now we've you know it's been, it's been good. We love doing it, and we'll continue to do it. And, and you know we were doing similar things and had a similar view, which is great. So if we look a little bit about international markets, and uh, I was actually, I saw a picture of uh, Whiskey L in Shanghai, which is a show which actually took place. And none of us were there. There was no international visitors, but there was a lot of people there, I hear, and a lot of people in, in, in masks and, and, and things, but I hear it went very well. Yeah. Um, and that's the exception. I mean, that's about the only show that I know outside of, that I've heard has gone on now. Actually, in China, we share the same distributor for Tamdu and Tomato. That's right. Or yeah. um, so yeah. we were both there. There was a Tamdu and a Tomato stand. And from what I hear, of course, it was the most popular. Of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't surprise I mean, me in the slightest. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I think, I think the key thing is that, you know, most of our – you know, we, we would be coming into what we would call the really silly season from now on. Yeah. From now until about the second week of December, you could be away every single weekend. Now, oh, we're not, you, I mean, you genuinely could be twice over. You could be at different shows all the way around Europe and all over yeah. the world. Um, and um, so this is normally a really, really busy time for us. And, and so we use an element of different resources so that, so that we have a bit of a life and weekends away and things like that. But um, with with the change of what's going on and and the you know the whiskey show in London that was that was going ahead and now is cancelled and running virtually, yeah. um, what's your view on how on how you sort of pivot from a sort of a, a live show into a into a virtual arena? The lockdown whiskey festival was was great and it was it was a really informative, interesting thing to be part of. And that was that was it never sort of had a physical element. It was just a total online. It's yeah. when you have an online a, a, a live show and you try and do it online, like the whiskey show is trying to do in London. What's your thoughts on that? Um, and and I the mean, experience it, it, for the consumer. One of the things that I've heard is that 
that people have said, the thing I love about the whiskey show is that, yes, I get to taste whiskeys, but I'm there with my friends and it's the conviviality and it's the, and, and that's what you don't get when you move virtually. A hundred percent. I think there is two sides to it. And, you know, I, I'm very conscious of when, when we talk about the current situation and draw positives from it, that there is actually, you know, that's not to overshadow what's going on in a lot of people's lives and the hardship it's causing. But, you know, we can draw some positives out of it. And I, I, a virtual show is never going to replace a physical show, um, just in the same way that sharing a drink with someone over Zoom is never going to replace actually being there. There is a difference in atmosphere. There's a difference in conversation, sharing, but it's it's better than nothing is almost where I get to with it, you know, and I, I think... For me, one of the great things about these virtual whiskey festivals is that people that otherwise wouldn't get to go to a whiskey festival are able to attend. So I think I look back at the the spread of people that attended the the lockdown whiskey festival. I say attended. It's a weird word. To use. <laughs> what? Yeah. It's probably the correct word. Engaged with. Um, and they were from all around the world. And there was people that had never been to a whiskey tasting before. There was people that had never been to a whiskey festival before. And they're able to get into it for the first time. So I think there is a the virtual side can bring new people to whiskey. It can break down a lot of barriers that the the physical world um, throws up. Yeah. That said, I am I, I can't wait to get back on the road and see people. You know, I think from a personal point of view, the, the festivals themselves are great, but I think that a lot of um, customers don't see when they come and talk to us at a stand is they don't see that the next morning you and I will go for a coffee before we go to start the show at The Hague and we'll get the crack there. And there is that connection with people. And I think for us, the way that we meet up uh, with each other at shows and we'll go for a drink and we'll go for a bit of food, that's very similar to the consumer showing up. And maybe it's the the one time of the year that they do actually meet their whiskey drinking friends, you know, mm. and they get to share that with them. And it's just, that's going to be lost. I think there's a lot, it's it's a tough one because up until now, I almost thought, you know, um, 31st of December, that'll be the end of it. And then when we get into January, we'll be back on planes yeah. again. Yeah. Show. Yeah. But actually, um, th this virus, it turns out, doesn't care about our calendar or when the end of the year doesn't is. Doesn't care about anything. No. So it might be longer than you think. And um even when we do go back to normal, I think there's going to be an element of the virtual. So I can see next year or when, whenever it may be, if I'm doing a masterclass um, in person, being able to have a virtual element where, or one whiskey, we call up the master distiller and get him to talk to the group. And I think that adds value, but I think it's going to have to be a marriage of the two. In terms of real life festivals adapting to the virtual world, there is an element from the producer point of view that I think is difficult because you'll know as well as I do that some shows that you go to, we get the rub of being next to the bigger brand stand, you know, people flooding to try. I, re I remember the whiskey show last year, the stand behind us was the stand that was pouring Karazawa, you know? So you had a lot of people in that queue that were having a drama to Matt and they're coming around going, Oh, wow. You know, I don't think the virtual, um, I think the way we did the festival was great because you had every brand had 15 minutes and everyone watched. This idea of every brand having an hour over the course of a week, I don't think it works as well for the producer. And I think mm. eventually some of the smaller producers who don't have the massive brand recognition might move away from it because it's not delivering the return that a real life festival maybe does. And then, the reason I bring that up is because that has a knock-on effect on the consumer who isn't yeah. able to see these brands. And that's yeah. that's where I can see it being a, a downturn. But hopefully it goes well. I mean I mean, you've got to hope that it goes well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And anything that anything that lies even in a you know, a, a less engaging way, which let's face it, is effectively what we said by doing it virtually, um, than being live, it, any engagement is good. And if people want to engage and people want to to, to, to do it, it should be a facility that's there. So full marks to everybody that's doing these things for sure. 100%. Um, and, and um, you know, we will, you know, I think, I think it's interesting to see how they will develop. But let's just hope 
2021 does return to an element of normality for everybody. Um, I think. I think one of the things that's also. I mean, I've been I've been working in the whiskey industry now since 2003, so um, I've seen a lot of changes in the whiskey industry for sure. But I think what's what's really interesting is that the this is this has changed the whiskey industry like nothing else in terms yeah. of not not in not in terms of trends or styles of whiskey, but in terms of how you speak to your customer. And I think that's a and and and. You can learn a lot from that and um, going forward into the new into the new sort of normal as it were um, and and uh, you know one of our major markets is the us as it yeah. is for everybody and it's a sort of bit of a holy grail for <laughs> well it is i guess as in you know but um, it, what's interesting about the us is is that you have funnily enough i think the us is in terms of its virtual capabilities it, it, it's not the opportunity is not quite as big there because mm -hmm. the nature of the way you business is done there, I've been to many, many sort of top end sort of whiskey bars, whiskey shows. I was speaking to the guys who who run whiskey shows over there. The thought of doing anything virtually is like, nah, we just won't do the show. Yeah. We just, and it's it's a very different, not mentality. I don't think that's right, but it's a very different approach of how they do things over there for sure. Yeah. Um, have you found that as well? Yeah, definitely. I think, honestly, I think one of the biggest things about it is that if you compare the US to the UK and and even to Europe as a whole, and you look at the way that we've adapted, I think a big part of it is for the last five years anyway, online retailers in the UK and Europe have grown massively. You know, you think of your Masters yeah. of Malts, your Whiskey Exchange, your Whiskey.de over in yeah. Germany. Yeah. From what I've noticed, that doesn't really exist in the same way in the United States. No. And I think as a result, this kind of, and don't get me wrong, there's a massive online whiskey community in the States. There's a massive, you know, Scotch Test Dummies, Scotch for Dummies, all, all these guys over there. Um, whiskey Tribe, massive, massive following. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's the consumer over there, but I don't think that the retailer... And, you know, we're already working with a three-tier system over there. Mm -hmm. So you're adding another link in the chain when you do something digital. Mm, yeah. um, it becomes a four- or five-tier system then. I, I just don't think that the consumer has the – or the retailer has that digital link to the consumer um, mm. in the same way that we do in the UK. And yeah. when, when you're working through a, a distributor, as is the case in any market, you don't have the degree of control. So, like, where it's very easy for us to host a, a tomato tasting in the UK virtually or a Glen Goyne tasting like you guys did the other night, which was fantastic, that's not so easy when you need distributor buy-in. Um, and, you know, one state is effectively the same size as the UK. So yeah. the spread is so much broader that there's just so many obstacles to overcome. I, I don't think it's impossible, and I think yeah. I think it does have to happen. Um, but it's it's really going to take. Uh, mm. I, I think what's going to have to happen is all of the companies are going to have to take their learnings from what they've done in their home markets and really showcase to the distributor how do we do this? How how do we scale this up in in yeah. the states? Um, the yeah. other thing that's going on in the states at the moment as well is is the tariffs. Yeah. Um, which I yeah, know, let's not jump into them because you could go on for hours with them. But there's a huge amount of more interest in national spirits over there than there ever has been before, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. Than, yeah. than necessarily Scotch. So it almost has to be led by the American whiskey industry yeah. and then, then be applied to Scotch, you know, to see that that can work, I think. No, absolutely. And, and let's just say, you know, the one thing I would say about the tariffs is it works both ways. The EU is tariffing yeah. bourbon at the moment and this, the US is tariffing scotch and, and other European products. Come on, guys. It's time to sort this out in the world that we live in. At the moment, absolutely. I mean, what ridiculous. Well, like when you, when you say it's a two way system, I've not heard of any bourbon tastings um, in the UK. You, no. you know, what I mean? so, so the issues that we're struggling with doing Scotch tastings in America, I think they're being felt the other way around. So mm. I dare say there probably is quite a few uh, bourbon producers doing virtual tastings over in America. Um, and we're maybe just not getting sight over that. Yeah, no, I think you're probably right. And I think, you know, as you say, the setup of America in terms of every state is different. There's yeah. laws that are different. The pricing in every state is different for whiskey. 
Yeah. Um, it, it, it is a bit of a, and it's even difficult to send whiskey from, you know, from Miami to New York. Or it's really hard to do. And so just yeah. even moving liquor around the US is difficult. So it just means it's a much more difficult market and its size, of course, is huge. So, um, yeah, that, that's very, very true. So a couple of questions just to finish on, uh, a couple of things just to ask you. So it, you've been with Tomatin for how long now? It's a, it's a funny one. <laughs> Technically, <laughs> three years. But um, yeah. I started working with Tomatin back in 2012, so eight years ago. But then yeah. in 2017, um, I moved to White and Mackay for a year. You did. Um, yeah. So when I, when I started at Tomatin, um, I started in a research role, moved into a sales role uh, looking after Europe. And then moved over to White and Mackay, where I looked after some markets. But then the opportunity popped up back at Tomatin to become their global brand ambassador and also work on the cask selection and blending side of the industry. So, you know, that's an opportunity you can't pass up as a whiskey no. lover. So uh, straight back to Tomatin after exactly 365 days away. Um, <laughs> well, there you go. So I've been back there for two years um, in this new role. Um, and. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Yeah, Love it. it yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's a slightly different than it probably should be normally. But uh, yeah. And and so in terms of if I could say to you your favorite market that you go to, what would it be? What's the market that you really look forward to going to? Um, what's the one that you think? Yeah, I really like going there. Yeah. Do you know what? That is actually a fantastic question. That's not one that I've been asked a lot recently. There's so, so many. And you're always no. sort of annoying somebody when you don't say say their market. I I love um, going to Switzerland. I love mm -hmm. the shows over there. Um, I love going to the Netherlands. Just the, the shows there are fantastic as well. Um, over the last couple of years, I've been able to go to Asia a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I actually had a tour of China planned back in April, and that obviously had to get cancelled. So I think actually I'm looking forward to going to markets that I've not been to before. Um, mm -hmm. but when I look at what, what do I want to go and do next, it's, it's the places I've not been. Um, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to getting back over to the States and Canada. Yeah, uh, Canada's good, yeah. yeah I love Canada. I and we're doing really well there, and I love the team that's there as well. So, um, yeah, the, do you know what? There's so many different things and so many – there's reasons to love different places, you know. I love um I love Singapore. Oh, but, yeah. Um yeah. but then you know it's places like the Netherlands that I meet you guys a lot more. Um yeah. so it's it depends almost not necessarily where you're going because a lot of the time it can be a hotel room and a conference center. Um, yeah. it's a case of it's not all glamour, is it? No, it's not. It's not, it's not, all, it's not everything that you see on Instagram, is it? Like, I've I've frequently found myself quickly running out before a show to get a photo. It looks like I've got the best life in the world and then running back into an event hall and putting on some comfy trainers to stand yeah, and talk yeah. for 10 hours. Um, definitely worse jobs in the world than that, though. Uh, but no, yeah, I think sure. it's not necessarily what market I'm looking back, looking forward to going back to. I'm looking forward to going back to these big whiskey festivals where all my mates are in the one country, mm. in the one city for a couple of nights and we can just chill out together. Yeah, no, I completely would agree with that. And, it, you know, as you say, it's the meeting of everybody else who works for all the other businesses from our perspective and, of course, our consumers who, who yeah. you, know, you know, they all love whiskey. So, you know, we, we all know some very good consumers who love when going to Martin, yeah. whatever else. So uh, it, it, that's what that and, and let's ultimately, as I always say to somebody, you know, gosh, you know, you guys travel a bit and you, you always see. We're not selling bricks or double glazing. We're selling whiskey. Whiskey yeah. is a social. It's a social tool. It's a, it's an element that gets people together. It's conviviality. It's it's social in a bottle. That's what it is. So so that's what I find really interesting about it as a product. Um, one and, one thing I always say is that even on our most stressful and worst day. We've got the best job in the world. Can you imagine being a pilot or a brain surgeon having a stressful day? That's got so many uh, higher risks than us. We get to, on our worst day, we get to work for some of the best companies in the world. You know, it's fantastic. Yeah. But, no, what about true. you? Do you have a market that stands out for you? Yeah, I mean, I've had a, yeah, I mean, I, as you know, I lived in Taiwan for a year, and I've right. got a little bit of a soft spot for Taiwan, just in yeah. terms of the people there are fabulous, and so I'm a bit of an Asia, I'm an Asian, I love Asia generally, 
Um, I think one of my most memorable tastings, I don't know if I've ever said this before, was when I actually worked before I was at um, Ian McLeod, I was at um, Morrison Beaumont, and I was, um, I did a Ockentoshan whiskey tasting on a beach in Bali, <laughs> which That's wasn't bad. bad. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't bad. We were pouring highballs and we were, and uh, it was lots of people in bikinis and, and, and swimming trunks and not me, obviously, but uh, <laughs> it was, it was a very unique uh, sort of, sort of, um, yeah, that was, the, I'm sitting there going, this is not a bad, this is not a bad thing to be doing. Yeah. Um, so, so that was quite interesting, but no, I mean, I, I love a bit like you. I love, I think, I think one of my favorite markets in, in is I love Canada. I love their passion for it. I think Alberta is a really great market to be in. Um, I love the States. I basically traveled everywhere. Russia has its, has its uniqueness as well. I mean, uh, I love, love Russia. I have to say, yeah. um, I, outside Moscow, Russia. outside Moscow predominantly. Yeah. I've been to Russia once and got to travel about a little bit. And, you know, I think that is one thing that you do learn in this role is that, um, any preconceived notions that you had about a place or a people are eroded as soon as you get oh, there. Yeah. And you have to find out that wherever you are in the world, the vast majority of people just want to be happy. And we get to help them do that with a good glass of whiskey. So, um, yeah, it almost doesn't matter where you are as long as the mentality is there for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, as ever, Scott, good to catch up. Um, thank you for coming on Whiskey Unscripted. Um, and um, let's hope we see you in person soon. Although I'm in Glasgow and we're now more locked down than we were yesterday. So uh, we, we, can't, we can't go and visit anybody, which is a bit of a shame. But we can still yeah, go to the pub, so that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate, it's been great speaking to you. And thanks for having me on. I've loved uh, tuning into the podcast over the last couple of months as well. It's great hearing you and uh, Gordon Dallas chatting away as well, uh, drum <laughs> going So, uh, thank you yeah. so much. No, good, good to, good to, good to have you on, and we'll hopefully see you some, somewhere very soon in a in a uh, in a whiskey show. Would be great. That would be nice. Right. Wouldn't it? Yeah. All right. You take care, my friend. You too. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Well done, Gordon. That was. I mean, what I love about it, you just covered so much ground. With, yeah, uh, Mr. Adamson. Yeah, he's great. He's good. It's good to have him on. So, uh, and I like how he dropped yeah. it in. He likes the show and all that. He's such. He's he's so good at getting in there, isn't he? And getting a oh. whiskey next time we see him. How Very could good. you not like the show? Buttering up, buttering up. How I love could him. you not like the show? Gordon, um, I am. Um, how you doing with the? How you doing with your add more? I've nailed it. Gone. Gone. Finished. I'm having a tiny, small triple of my um, North British green whiskey. Very good. And Very I don't, good. You know, as you say, it's not going to maybe take over the world, but it is interesting. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I know Gervin yeah, do right. a 20, my local waitrose, but um, it is an interesting dram. It's a very different dram, and I'm not, not dissing it at all. Great dram, fantastic dram, but just, you know, the point that, you know, not many, not many single grains get to sort of 12 or older than that, and it's nice to see them coming through because they, they do produce a really nice style of whiskey. Generally like. Very nice. Gordon, that is coming up for the end of episode four. We have got yeah. lots on our plates because we're conducting a few interviews in the next uh, few days, so it's going to be quite we exciting. Are. Lots of good stuff coming up. We are. We are. So, no, really looking forward to it. But great to have Scott on another great episode. Nice and short and punchy and to the point as ever. <laughs> so if, you, if you've got, a, you know, as we said, if you've got two dogs walking differently, or, you know, this could, this could cover a couple of dog walks. Of course, that's the idea. We're doing it every 10 days and... Um, so a little yeah. bit more per episode, but it's more spaced out. I think that's, that's the way to go. I know you can just... OK, Gordon, thank you very much. Me and the homeboys are going to be hanging out with yourself. I'm going to the west side. You can't drink a house. Gold. Um, you can't drink gold. Or you can't drink a house. A house. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <laughs>